Hello everybody, it's Miss Gould, media teacher here, and in this short video tutorial, I'm just going to be going over the two companies that own Teen Vogue and The Voice. Now already you may remember for your lessons uh, prior to lockdown, these are two very different companies. So on the one hand, Teen Vogue is owned by what we would call a media conglomerate in Condé Nast, and with The Voice, it is owned by the GV Media Company, a very different setup to Condé Nast. Both of these companies though are commercial companies so they are looking to make a profit but at the same time we could argue that they fulfill a public service through their political reporting and also their social campaigns. Teen Vogue is owned by Condé Nast, a global media company which is more than 100 years old with more than 1 billion consumers in 32 markets. Now you might think Teen Vogue must tow its corporate publisher's line, but what it can do, and what it has been doing successfully, is educating its readership on issues that they might not have ever been exposed to. Teen Vogue receives around 10 million monthly page views, and it has over 12 million social media followers, many of them young women. It is essentially a profit-making venture for Condé Nast, which closed the hard copy of the magazine at the end of 2017 to go purely online in January 2018. From its inception in 2003, Team Vogue's focus was about inclusion and diversity and showing an awareness of sustainability and climate change. It was not afraid to be bold in its headlines. Teen Vogue has not been afraid to be outspoken in its opinions and its viewpoints with articles delighting Generation Z, no doubt. Uh, for example, the ones that you can see here um, about striking in the workplace um, and also uh, a positive article about Karl Marx. And you can imagine how that will have gone down in Republican America. Quartz magazine went as far as to say that Teen Vogue, well, that Teen Vogue would terrify men like Donald Trump. Some have argued rather cynically that corporate companies like Condé Nast have decided to cash in on the wokeness of Generation Z. Media conglomerates, of course, are driven by the profit motive and not changing the world. But some would argue that if it brings an issue to the public's attention or helps show mainstream support for the marginalised, does the motive really matter? OK, so here's a term, woke washing. I want you to watch this clip that follows and define the term and consider whether you think Teen Vogue does this. It's essentially, in a really reductive way, it is when an advertiser uses a social movement, usually new way, uses a social movement and attaches the values and ethics of that movement onto a brand. And what that usually means is that the person that engages with them, they're usually trying to reach a different type of audience or demographic that maybe they haven't reached before. And usually what it means or the intention of it from the advertiser is that now when you as a customer engage with that brand commercially, you're essentially assuaging your desire to be you know, a, a virtuous person and part of, that part of that movement and, you know, that's something you believe in and stand up for as well. And by buying this thing, I'm part of that, this brand understands me and my social, you know, design. And I think cynically as well, these brands are just trying to target a certain demographic that they think might be too far, right? The brands might think that that demographic have their beliefs. However, the advertising agency that comes up with these ideas might be composited of people that do have those beliefs. So for them, it's brands, true. Like all brands want to target segments of the population and will come up with different ways in which to target different segments of the population. It's like, is this a terrible thing or is this a thing that does work for brands? It's risky. I would be more nuanced with my approach to it, I think. <laughs> if I was going to use things that people found relevant to their lives and I had a... To be honest, for me, it's this, right? If I owned a brand that lived that truth and had those values yeah. as a brand, yeah. I would do it. If I owned a brand that was a big not global big corporation, global no corporation you know, that might accidentally have some like, you know, child labour over there, but goes, hey, we're all about positive, you know, social yeah, justice, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't do it because it's inauthentic. But look, it comes back to what you always say about um, the kind of content consuming social landscape just being really media savvy. So they actually just they see, see through, through it. it. Yeah. So if you have a big global brand that's really just kind of 
all about global <coughs> expansion that suddenly attached itself to the societal issue of the moment, then people are really cynical about that. Yeah. But if you were actually a brand that was born out of that societal movement because your founder had been, or whatever, somehow yeah. you were linked to it and you yeah. attached yourself to that, yeah. then that would massively go in your face and everyone would 100% buy into you. So it's just about, it comes back to what we always talk about time and time again, being real and honest because you can't actually not do that in the social landscape because it's so you're so exposed yeah we'll get caught out instantly so woke washing is the appropriation of ethical and progressive values as a form of advertising just to make more profit while hiding the dark side of conventional capitalistic business management and do you think that woke washing is used by team vogue in order to drive up profits and how about this M&S sandwich, which Piers Morgan lambasted on Twitter for being a good example of woke washing? So, Teen Vogue, progressive and ethical, or cynically being woke to drive profit? It started in 2003 as a sister magazine to the world's most famous fashion magazine, which you'll all have heard of, Vogue. But after a steep decline in sales due to changes in audience consumption habits, Team Vogue went online only in early 2018. It also changed focus from merely fashion and beauty to becoming more political and more subversive. And it put news and politics first as a way of connecting with its digitally native, woke demographic. Don't forget that when Teen Vogue was a mainstream hard copy magazine, it flopped, it did badly, it had to be closed down and become a online entity only. It had to reinvent itself in order to remain relevant to its target audience. And it's got millions, millions of people tuning in across the globe. However, with that, it had to shift its margins. It had to show that it had a very different focus to what it had when it was only producing magazines, hard copies. Another thing that you might have to argue is that Teen Vogue is shaping the political attitudes of many American women of the next generation. A big conglomeration is therefore acting as a cultural manipulator. But then all big media entities need to do that in order to survive. They simply can't just follow the trends. The Voice, on the other hand, whilst it was a fearlessly campaigning newspaper with a devoted readership in the past, The Voice Online is nothing like its predecessor. It only has a very tiny team, and I'm sure that its readership has shot up since it ended up on the AQA syllabus. It doesn't effectively cover news stories affecting black Britons, the Guardian led the way on the Windrush scandal, for example, and mostly it seems to process press releases and cut and paste material. There are no published figures, but it appears that The Voice has a tiny and falling audience. If the magazine can only afford a tiny team like this, then it can't have the readership to support major advertising revenue. Unlike Teen Vogue, this is not a product that is reaching its target demographic. In the early 1980s, there was a strong sense from within the black community that they needed a newspaper. Events like the Brixton riots were being reported on by journalists on mainstream television and in newspapers and they were often negative towards black people with a lot of negative stereotyping going on. Black people were always being represented from a white person's perspective and in many ways this links back to the post-colonial ideas of Stuart Hall and Paul Gilroy. Val McCalla started the newspaper in 1982 from a small council flat in East London in order to give black people in Britain a voice. It started with a print run of only 4,000 copies, but within eight years was selling over 53,000 copies a week. The paper targeted a second generation of the black British diaspora, those whose experience did not lead them to look at the nation state as home. By the late 1990s, the readership of The Voice had dropped to around 12,000 and the paper was not doing well against a new rival, The New Nation, which seemed to be a lot more in tune with what was going on in the black community at that time. When McCalla died in 2002, the whole thing was thrown into disarray. It wasn't financially viable 
and it was sold off to the GV Gleaner Media Group in Jamaica in 2004. Convergence means when a media product contains multiple platform experiences for the audience and the voice is a good example of a converged product, as is Teen Vogue, incidentally. The voice has a Facebook, Instagram and YouTube presence and that allows it to connect with a new audience. But interestingly, there are few views, retweets and comments. You should consider Clay Shirky's end of audience theory when thinking about the voice actually because in many ways this theory explains why the audience has left the voice online. It is largely a non-interactive product. Another added issue for the voice is that any kind of Google search or even when you're on social media for the voice takes you to the NBC show The Voice or the UK equivalent. On a final note, make sure that you understand the challenges media brands face as a result of changes in technology. It's really important you keep up to date with what's going on in the media industry. For example, I've been reading today and it says about Condé Nast, profits are declining quite significantly in Western Europe, whereas the company is doing really well in Asia. So that will be an interesting thing to watch. Also, as we've seen in lessons before lockdown, the Voice website has revamped its house style and its whole look and colour palette in keeping with a more contemporary design trend. It's been largely positive of late for Team Vogue because it's managed to jump on the woke zeitgeist, but for The Voice, with its much smaller parent company, the GV Gleaner Media Company, and a niche audience, it's been much harder for it to adapt to an online presence and retain its original target audience, as well as attract a younger, more digitally savvy Bain demographic who have a plethora of online material that they can consult. New and digital technology has had a huge impact on traditional media industries and Teen Vogue and The Voice are two key media products which demonstrate that. <laughs>